Mother Volga, the longest river in Europe, Russia's life artery. Just under one million people live in Volgograd today. The city sprawls along the banks of the Volga for 90 kilometers. The city used to be called Tsaritsyn, then Stalingrad. I am Stepan Ratsin, known as Stenka. With my Cossacks, I am fighting the boyars and against all those who are robbing the farmers of their money. It's time for a rebellion. Tatars and other tribes were constantly raiding the steppes along the Volga. The appeal by Catherine the Great was intended to bring as many settlers as possible to Russia's south. My name is Christian Gottlob Zuge. I am German. Really, I wanted to go to America. Now, I have ended up on the Russian steppe. Volgograd is an important commercial center. Several trade routes join up here. The substance around which all else revolves is oil. My name is Robert Nobel. I am Swedish. I got rich with my oil fields, but can luck and happiness be bought? In World War II, Stalingrad was the site of a ferocious battle in which more than a million people died. My name is Galina Alexeyevna Makazinova. I was born here. We were at work when the first bombs started falling. Russia had not seen a rebellion like this before. In the early summer of 1670, a host of angry Cossacks reached Tsaritsyn, today's Volgograd. Their leader was Stenka Ratsin, one of the most fascinating figures in Russian history. They were hunting the boyars, the rich landed gentry, viewed by the Cossacks as oppressors of the people. In Tsaritsyn, the boyars had retreated into a tower in the city walls, in vain. Let us live. We'll do anything you want. The governor of Tsaritsyn, Timofey Turgenev, had no chance against Stenka Ratsin's men. They took him down to the Volga and threw him into the river. Stepan Timofeyevich Ratsin was one of a wealthy Cossack family from the Don. A person full of passion, strength and a keen spirit. The Don Cossacks had formed three federations of horsemen on the South Russian steppes. The fertile lands of the Tsarist Empire belonged to the boyars, and they demanded high taxes from the farmers. Many farmers had left home and hearth and fled south, and there were more and more of them. Stenka Ratsin put himself forwards as protector of these landless peasants. The story of the rebellion starts in the Volga Delta. Here, the seemingly endless river branches out before it flows into the Caspian Sea. Here, the windows onto Asia open. Far countries with their mysterious stories, exotic foods, an enticing sense. In September 1669, Stenka Ratsin came ashore here. For two years, his men had been pirates, striking terror into sailors on the Volga and the Caspian Sea. He could rely on his men. He plundered many towns and gathered riches in Persia. Now he wanted to return home to the Don. But first he had to take a rest because the road past Tsaritsyn and the other Volga towns was dangerous. A good opportunity to bring the treasures to land and enjoy looking at them. The raid had been a great success. Stenka Ratsin was content with himself. His wife Aljona was waiting for him at home. He'd captured her during a fight with the Tatars. Nobody back home need know that he spent many a night with a captured chieftain's daughter, 
especially since he threw her into the Volga in front of all his men, just as he always did when someone got bothersome. In far off Moscow, they'd had enough of Stenkaratsin. Half a year earlier, the Tsar had issued him a pardon. If he stopped thieving, all his crimes would be forgiven. Usually, Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich was known as the peaceful, but his patience had reached its limits. In a letter, he requested that the city fathers along the Volga confiscate weapons, munitions and booty from the Cossacks. Meanwhile, Stenka Ratsin was passing the Volga town of Tsaritsin on his way to the Don. He wanted to stop here with his men, as they were hungry and thirsty. How fortunate that there were many guest houses here. But the landlord demanded 20 rubles for the modest feast. That's too much, replied Stenka. But we have to charge you double, stammered the frightened landlord. The governor has ordered it. Then the farmers told him that they often had to pay the boyars excessively high taxes. If you couldn't pay, you were taken prisoner and even maltreated. Many were still languishing in jail. The governor of Tsaritsin later wrote, The Cossacks under Stenke Ratsin want to kill me. I jumped out of the window and broke my leg. Then Stenka broke the lock to the prison and released all the prisoners. On his onward journey to the Don, an idea started growing in Stenka Ratsin. If they finally want to live free, then the Cossacks would have to fight the boyars on a broad front. In short, all those who were lining their pockets at the expense of the farmers. In his home on the Don, Stenka Ratsin encountered a deceptive calm. He gave a rousing speech at the annual Cossack meeting in Cherkask, the capital of the Don Cossacks. Cossacks, we will exterminate the traitors in Russia and bring freedom to the poor. This was the starting signal for rebellion against the big landowners and against serfdom. With his men, Stenka Ratsin prepared to conquer whole areas around the Don and Volga. He commanded an army of 7,000 men. Soon it grew to 200,000. In Tsaritsin, Astrakhan and the other Volga towns, Razin's men were joined by countless farmhands, serfs and even Tsarist soldiers. The rebellion escalated into a peasant and Cossack war. What remained was a trail of destruction. Whilst the common people welcomed Razin's troops enthusiastically and admired his audacity, the boyars and city governors paid with their lives. They destroyed and plundered and burnt our houses and killed our women and children with sabers. That was what they said in a letter to the Tsar. The Volga region became one huge battlefield. The rebels moved from Tsaritsin north along the Volga. The decision was taken in September 1670 at Simbirsk. The Cossacks had been laying siege to the city for nearly a month. Then suddenly a host of one and a half thousand soldiers of the Tsar appeared and prepared to attack. Stenka Ratsin wasn't reckoning with that. He was fighting in the front line. but he was not invulnerable. His men managed to bring him to safety, but the mystique that surrounded him and his army had gone. After Simbirsk, fortunes changed. The rebellion, formidable but disorganized, had failed. Thousands of Cossacks were now executed. 
Stenka Ratzin was arrested and brought to the Cossack town of Cherkask, to the place where he'd called the rebellion only a few months before. The chains that bound him can still be seen in the Church of Resurrection. They took him to Moscow, where he was interrogated by the Tsar himself. Stenka Ratzin was executed on Red Square, outside the gates of the Kremlin, on the 6th of June, 1671. To this day, with fear and admiration, the Russian people remember the Cossack leader who dared to defy the Tsar. His riches are said to be buried beneath the Stenkaratzin cliff, north of Volgograd. I came to slay the rich masters and to share fairly with the poor and simple people. If you drive from the center of Volgograd south along the river, you arrive at a German settlement with German houses and a German Protestant church built in the early 19th century. and three hours' drive further north, a Catholic church in the middle of the steppe. Traces of German settlement are also evident in the villages between Volgograd and Saratov. Signs of a foreign culture in an area that couldn't be more Russian. Tsar Peter the Great already tried to settle farmers here in the early 18th century because the Volga region was largely uninhabited and at the mercy of Tatars, Kazakhs, Kalmyks and other nomadic peoples. But it was only 40 years after Peter's death that a colorful group of adventurers and pioneers arrived in the hope for a better life. Germans. The story of one of these immigrants starts in the North German port of Lübeck. In 1765, people of diverse traits and origins gathered here. They all had one aim, to seek their fortune in a distant land. Nineteen-year-old toolmaker Christian Gottlob Züge from Gera had ended up here. From a young age, he dreamed of foreign lands. Now he wanted just one thing, to see the big wide world, preferably America. Over a thousand people were looking at the boats in Lübeck's harbor with longing. Economic misery and bitter experience during the Seven Years' War had persuaded them that there was only one cause, to leave their country. More and more often, strange men were turning up in Lübeck's dockside taverns. They were conspicuously well-dressed and always in a good mood. They would speak to anybody who wanted to get away. So what brings you here? We want to emigrate to America. America? But haven't you heard of the appeal issued by Catherine the Great? Catherine? Russia? No, we want to go to America. We've had enough of life here. And they talk of a land that Christian Gottlieb Züger only knows from hearsay, Russia. We will allow all foreigners who come to our realm to settle in any province they like. Yes, that sounds good. But I don't know. In the previous year, two and a half thousand people had followed the invitation of the Empress, herself German-born. In her proclamation, Catherine the Great promised all colonists money and land. Was it possible to turn down such an offer? 
my imagination transported me to meadows and pastures, so sparkling and lovely as they might not have been in paradise. Maybe Russia is a better destination than America. Okay. I'll do it. I'll go to Russia. After six weeks, they finally set off. Their course took them past Bornholm across the Gulf of Finland to Kronstadt near St. Petersburg. There, Christian Gottlob Zuger stepped onto Russian soil for the first time in his life. He was even allowed to look upon the Empress with his own eyes in the Oranienbaum Pleasure Palace. She had come to inspect the new arrivals, a moment that would remain in his memory for a long time. In his memoirs, he later talked about a rare combination of great beauty and exalted majesty, which powerfully impressed him. The path of the German settlers continued overland to Novgorod. At Tver, they finally reached the Volga. But the destination was still a long way off. Soon, the onset of winter made it impossible to carry on. The Volga was frozen and the settlers had to overwinter in a small village. Spring only returned after many cold months. Before continuing his journey, Christian Gottlob Zuga experienced the Russian Easter celebrations. The ordinary Russians find great enjoyment in getting drunk, but carry it off well compared to us and other nations. They get more hearty and affectionate with each other, kiss and hug each other, and sing happy songs. He had been developing deeper feelings for his hostess, who was being maltreated by her husband because of her childlessness. The looks my hostess gave me indicated that she was not averse, with my help, to the idea of seeing whether she could be freed of all the reproaches that she was subjected to and which hurt her. I often received baked goods, with which I was very pleased. This did not go unnoticed. The brawl ended without major disaster, but one thing was clear, the settlers had to move on quickly. As soon as the weather permitted, Christian Gottlob Zuger and the other colonists continued their journey south. The way across the steppes of South Russia seemed to have no end. Gradually, Zuger began to wonder if he'd made the right decision. After many weeks, partly on land, partly on the Volga, they finally approached Saratov. This was to be the capital of the Volga Germans over the next few decades. German street has elements of German architecture to this day. I hardly knew I was in Russia since I could live amongst Germans, of which there were many in Saratov. On they went across endless steps. Slowly, Christian Gottlob Zuge started getting anxious. He'd got an advance of 150 rubles from the German consul in Saratov. He'd bought a horse and a cart for 12 rubles. Then, one hot afternoon... We have arrived. This is our destination. So this is supposed to be this paradise that was promised us in Lübeck? 
Courage, boy. The promised houses will be built. Chin up. It seems more like paradise lost to me. Of course, it was stupid of us to think that Russia's uninhabited areas should be a Garden of Eden. Around 100 German settlements were to be planned and built for the 28,000 immigrants who found their way to the Volga. But nothing was happening where Christian Gottlob Züge was supposed to settle. Nobody knew how long it would take before Russian carpenters came to build the promised houses for the Germans. Weeks, possibly even months. What was he going to live on for so long? He'd imagined this completely differently. One thing was clear, he wasn't staying here. In 1774, Zuger returned to Germany, to the town of his birth, Gera. Here he wrote his memoirs. He wasn't to experience the heyday of the Volga Germans. In 1941, during World War II, the dictator Stalin would forcibly relocate the Volga Germans to Kazakhstan and Siberia. Today, there is not much left to remind us that Germans used to live here along the Volga. The Sarepta quarter in the south of Volgograd is an exception. Here, the memory of the Germans is kept alive to this day. In 1765, settlers belonging to the Moravian Church opened a mission here. Their aim to evangelize the Buddhist Kalmyk people. Sarepta developed to become one of the most important economic centers in the region. The biggest mustard factory in Russia was built here. Its products were delivered to the Tsarist court. You can buy Sarepska mustard in Russia to this day. At the end of the 19th century, Russia was trying to catch up economically with Western Europe. The population of Tsaritsyn, today's Volgograd, increased tenfold within a few decades to 100,000. Technological advances made the town to a commercial center and traffic junction for southern Russia. The Volga is the only continuous waterway between the north of the country and the Caspian Sea, the gateway to Asia, where only a few decades earlier, barge haulers were still pulling the ships, motorized barges were now plying up and down the river. And they were transporting a material that would change the world. In the spring of 1874, a man was traveling south on the Volga, his name Robert Nobel, a Swede living in St. Petersburg. His path took him first to Tsaritsyn. From there, he wanted to continue to Baku on the Caspian Sea. How far away St. Petersburg now seemed. Robert's brother Ludwig was the director of a weapon factory in Perm. Robert was supposed to be here to buy walnut wood for rifle butts. His second brother, Alfred, had returned to Sweden after many years. He invented dynamite. But Robert had long had something else in mind. They were all talking now about the black gold. You used to sell kerosene, didn't you? He met the quirky Dutch Captain de Boer and spent many an evening in his cabin a well-traveled man who had seen a lot and knew the Russian rivers and seas like the back of his hand, and he seemed to know about the oil business. That's true. I myself have a few oil fields and a small refinery. Look here, that is the oil. There had to be something about this stuff. Maybe that would be a chance for Robert to finally stand on his own two feet financially. 
Nehmen Sie eine Probe. As he'd sold kerosene a few years before, Robert Nobel had enough experience to distinguish good oil from bad oil. Richtig gut. He could buy the oil fields and a small refinery on the Caspian Sea from the captain. For 25,000 rubles, his brother's money intended for timber. Maybe it would be the foundation for immense wealth. At this time, Baku was a lively harbor town the gateway between Europe and Asia, a transshipment point for the fabrics and sugar, Persian fruits, silk and carpets, east and west met here. The first drill for oil was carried out here as early as 1844. The Russian state had only ceded its monopoly on oil sources two years before Robert Nobel's Volga journey. Nobel decided to buy the oil fields from the captain as he was convinced that good business could be done here. Okay, Ludwig. Robert Nobel and his brother Ludwig revolutionized the Russian oil industry. They developed new methods, built pipelines and the first oil tanker in the world. And they had a groundbreaking idea. If they built loading terminals and rail tracks along the Volga, they could transport their oil, regardless of the time of year, to all of Russia and further afield. Central to the plan was Tsaritsin, by now an important commercial center on the Volga. With the opening of the railway line between Tsaritsin and Kalach in May 1862, there was now a connection from the Volga to the Don, and thus to the west, to Europe. Here the brothers built a large oil-loading terminal, Nobeltown. No one had seen anything like it before. A worker's estate with its own doctors, pharmacy, crash, school, library, and much more. Tsaritsin had the first telephone line in Russia and the whole estate was electrified many years before the rest of the town. The Nobel brothers soon employed more than a thousand people with their oil emporium. The name Nobel rapidly became known throughout the country. The relationship between the two brothers grew increasingly cool. Ludwig dominated the business and kept cycling Robert. When the Emporium was to be transformed to a joint stock company, arguments flared up. Robert was against, Ludwig and their brother Alfred, who was writing eager letters from Paris, overruled him. Robert's opinion carried no weight. Even though it was his idea to build up the oil business, his brother Ludwig was playing the boss. Soon, 70% of the oil extracted in Baku was going through Tsaritsin, along their own rail tracks and along the Volga, which is a kilometer wide here. The Nobel brothers transported their products over the whole continent. By the summer of 1881, Robert had finally had enough. It was he who'd made the Nobel brothers the richest men in Russia. Was he to be downgraded to a mere clerk? That was not why he had bought the oil fields from the Dutch captain. Robert returned to Sweden and retired from the business. By 1900, Tsaritsin was the center of the raw materials trade in southern Russia. In the middle of the First World War, the revolution started in St. Petersburg. The Bolsheviks had their sights on the Nobel concern. In 1920, the oil firm was nationalized and the Nobel family returned to Sweden. In Tsaritsin, an ambitious Georgian became head of the supply service. His name, Josef Vazironovich Yukashvili. 
known as Stalin. By the time he became General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party, the city had been renamed after him, Stalingrad. In 1941, Hitler's army attacked the Soviet Union. The following year, Stalingrad became the stage for one of the most ferocious battles of World War II, a battle that has left its mark on the city to this day. The summer of 1942 was very hot in Stalingrad. The people were trying to enjoy the sun, despite the ever-present fear. The war so far was going badly for the Soviet Union. The German army had advanced to the Volga. Stalin had forbidden the population to leave the town. No retreat was the slogan. Even women and children had to dig trenches and help with the upgrading of the defenses. Fourteen-year-old Galina Makazinova is also obliged to work. Until then, the concept of war had had no meaning for her. We thought that the Germans were people too, just with a different language. We learned German at school. We didn't understand why they would attack the Soviet Union. Before the great air raids of 1942, the Germans had dropped leaflets over the city. They said that Stalingrad was surrounded and its days were numbered. A few days later, the Germans started ferociously bombarding the town. In the first few days of the air raids, some 40,000 people lost their lives. Galina was also injured, but could be rescued. The city was a conflagration. The Volga was also burning as the flaming oil flowed from the tanks into the river. Galina's eldest brother was caught in the hail of bombs. The soldiers came running towards us. They weren't calling for my mother, but for me. One said my brother had been hit, but was still alive and asked if I could come. I ran over. Half his stomach was hanging out. Nearly all his innards were on the floor. But he was still breathing and could speak a little. He said, write to Papa on the front that I died. He had no message for my mother. Then he fell silent and died. Soon they are battling for individual streets and buildings. By November 1942, the Germans had gained near control over Stalingrad. Only a tiny strip along the Volga was still in Russian hands. Amongst the German soldiers was Vincent Skrizema. At 19, one of the youngest. Nearly 70 years after the battle, he visits the town that shaped his life. When I was in Russia, it was quite obvious to me, through all the propaganda, that we would meet bad people, a primitive people. The Russians were a lesser breed, they weren't Aryan. To be honest, this is what we thought, they're only Russians, we had no sympathy. I can't understand that today anymore, but that is how it was. It was too late for a complete evacuation. Around 75,000 people had to stay in the ruined city. Many would starve or freeze to death in the coming winter. Galina fled with her mother, brother and sister to stay with an aunt in the west of the town. When we walked through town with the cart, it was a nightmare. Everything was burning. We heard screaming. 
где-то были стоны. Идти было невозможно. We could hardly walk because there were flames everywhere. That was very, very bad. We saw real war. In the ruins of her hometown, she had to witness the death of her second brother. Her sister Lida was burning in her house. She couldn't save her. The Germans had destroyed the city almost completely, but fortunes were about to turn. In November 1942, a huge counter-offensive began. After bitter fighting, Soviet troops managed to surround the German 6th Army. The fighting was especially fierce in the Red October factory. Supplies could no longer get through to the surrounded Germans. Many soldiers died of starvation or hypothermia. On the 31st of January 1943, the German 6th Army surrendered to the Soviet troops. The soldiers were taken prisoner, mostly young men who pointlessly had to risk their lives for an inhuman ideology. What damage we wreaked, what we did, all destroyed. It was entirely feasible we would get shot. We had lice, hadn't changed clothes in eight weeks. All of us prisoners had lice. And with the lice came typhus. That's how we went to the prison camp. Vincent Griesemer was taken to the Frolov prison camp around 100 kilometers from Stalingrad together with 6,000 other Germans. Three months later, only 1,000 of them were still alive. It was to be more than 10 years before the last of the German prisoner of wars was sent home again. Stalingrad, the former Tsaritsyn, had perished. Around 150,000 Germans and over 1 million Russians had lost their lives. It would be a long time before normal life was possible again in this place. In late February 1943, Galina Makatsinova returned to Stalingrad with her mother. First, we removed the corpses. They gave us a horse cart. Then us four girls dug out the corpses with our bare hands, put them in the cart and took them away. From the ruins of Stalingrad, a communist model city was created after the war. German prisoners of war were drafted to help with the rebuilding. The memories of the misery and atrocities were to be removed from the city's image as quickly as possible. In the center, broad thoroughfares were built in the late Stalinist style, a Soviet town, a hero city on scorched earth. The sacrifices of the defenders were not to be forgotten. In 1959, building works for a monumental memorial begin on the Mamayev Kurgan north of the city center. During the fighting, the hill was the scene of fierce battles. At 82 meters, one of the tallest freestanding statues in the world was being built here. The motherland calls. The work took eight years. The statue became the city's landmark. By the time the official inauguration took place in 1967, the city had long had a new name, Volgograd. This is where Galina Makasinova and Vincent Grisema are meeting. 70 years after they experienced the town in ruins.
He learned Russian in the prisoner of war camp and has refreshed his knowledge in the last few years with several trips to Russia. In the 1960s, a part with the whole of soldiers' glory was laid out on the slopes leading down to the Volga. Behind the remembrance flame are written the names of 7,200 soldiers who fell during the battle. The Mamayev Kurgan is the most visited memorial in Russia. But in the 1990s, a place of reconciliation was built outside the city gates with the help of the German War Graves Commission. The Rososhka War Cemetery. So far, 40,000 soldiers have found their final resting place here. Before the battle, it was the site of a village with 2,000 inhabitants. After the fighting, it was completely devastated. Wir sind dahin und niemand hat uns gerufen. Und da sage ich immer, was für ein Wahnsinn der Krieg ist. Mit einem Wort gesagt. We went there uninvited. I always say what madness war is, in a word. When you see what fathers, sons were sacrificed for madness, stupidity. Whilst in prison I saw that Russians are humans, that they are sons, have sisters and mothers. They can laugh and cry just like us. There was no longer a difference for me. And I am of the opinion, in some things, the Russians can show more heart than the Germans. It is a different mentality, and I learned to appreciate that. There should be peace and no animosity. And besides, there is now a young generation that should understand that neither the Russians nor the Germans want war. They don't want their families to perish. Health to all peoples, the Russians and the Germans. May the heavens be peaceful, the sun shine, health and happiness. May there be no tears, and may God give everybody the best. Thank you.